Good morning, and good morning to those of you watching online and at our Pecola campus as well. Like Brandon said, my name is Jason Thomas. If you don't know who I am, I've gotten the privilege to, to speak here a couple other times. Um, I'm the youth, pa- or the, yeah, the youth pastor at our Pecola campus, and so um, I'm happy to be here with you this morning. I'm excited to be doing what we get to do today, which is conclude the Sermon on the Mount. If you've been with us for a while, you know that we have been in the Sermon on the Mount for, man, forever. Like, it's been a long time. It's been, I think, like a year or so now. We started in the Beatitudes, and then we just kind of continued on from there. And today, we're going to finish up the Sermon on the Mount and move on uh, to whatever else we're going to learn next. It's been a long time coming, and and like I said, I'm really excited to finish this incredible series. It's been so good, full of good teaching. What we've been doing as we've gone through this is we've been looking at what it looks like to live as a citizen of God's kingdom. Jesus has been shaping us and molding us and teaching us what it means to be disciples of Christ, to be a disciple of the kingdom of God. Now, this is incredibly important for us, not just as Christians, not just as believers, but us specifically at this church because our mission here is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And so this, this, this series has been full of good teaching, uh, but I am excited to wrap it up and, and kind of move on to the next thing. Uh, years ago, when I was a kid, um, my, my stepdad decided he had this building outside of our house that was kind of old and, and broken down. It was this like detached garage with like this grungy dirt floor and like the walls were kind of like wonky and shaping in. And so he decided, you know what, I want to close that garage in and I want to make it into a shop and, and turn it into like a usable space. Because right now it was just like you had something you didn't want and you threw it in there because it was open and you could. So he's like, I want to make this into a workable area. And so what I didn't know was the many, many hours that that was going to take, all the time that that was going to take. So like young, naive me was like, okay, we'll knock this out in like a week and we'll be done. But it was like months down the road. We're finally seeing electricity in the building. We're seeing it closed in. But before we could do all of those good things like adding electricity and air conditioning, before we could put up drywall and paint and, and put down good flooring, something needed to be addressed first. You see that dirt floor that was in there? It was wonky and and misshapen and and rain had come and washed out certain areas. And so it was just not a very solid ground. It was not good foundation. So the first thing that had to be done before we could do any of the good things we had envisioned, we had to address the foundation because we knew if we began to just build out on this bad foundation, then, then the rest of the building would be in jeopardy. The rest of what we wanted to do would be in jeopardy. So we needed a solid base to build on. Today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, continuing on, like I said, finishing up the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be in verses 24 through 27. Now, in my Bible, uh, which is ESV, I know Jason's an NASB guy, but I like ESV. The title of this section is Build Your House on the Rock. And so, starting off in verse 24, I just want to read through these, and then I want to go back and address what's being said here. Starting off, it says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Would you pray with me? Father, we, we are excited. We, we come uh, to you just looking for your wisdom, looking for your words, looking uh, to be encouraged by you, looking for your instruction this morning. So God, I pray that as we walk through this last parable, as we begin to break it down, that, that you would uh, fill us up with your spirit, that we would see what, you, what it is that you want us to get out of this message today. Uh, God, I just pray for clarity on my part, uh, God, that you would work through me and that nothing that I say would just be um, some rehearsed message, but God, that it would all flow completely from you. And God, I just pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Now, with this parable, Jesus is kind of bringing things to a close. He's wrapping things up, tightening it up, putting a bow on it, and just kind of sending it off and saying, here's, here's the words, now you, you go and live them out. So in, these verse, in this last few verses here, Jesus He's drawing a dividing line between himself, who he is, and other foundations people try to build their life on. He's saying, this is me. I'm the solid rock. This is everything else. There's one solid rock, and that is me. In verse 24, he says, everyone then 
who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, he doesn't just say, like, those who attended this Sermon on the Mount and then went away and never did anything about it. He doesn't just say those who take a few notes down in their Bible or put a few things in their phone, those are the ones. No, he says those who hear what he has to say and do what he has to say. James 1.22 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Being doers of the word and not hearers only, that is the only proper response to the word of God. And I don't just mean like the gospel. We, we typically know what the gospel is. We know what the good news is. I mean the entirety of scripture. We have to take the entirety of scripture and be doers of the word, not just hearers only. We must allow the word of God to take root in our lives and we must become doers. James 2, 20 through 22 says, do you want to be shown how you foolish person that faith apart from works is useless. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. I'm going to kind of do my best Jason impression this morning, and I'm going to pull out a little Greek, uh, not typically something I do, but I've been inspired by his sermons. And so in, in, this, in these verses in James, he uses the Greek word dikaio, and I'm sure afterwards Jason's going to be like, no, you pronounced that completely wrong. Uh, but the best I could pronounce it is dikaio, for justify, and this is to emphasize the way in, works, in the way in which works demonstrate that someone has been justified. It's evidenced by the good works that that person does. That's how you know that they are justified. Full-grown and genuine faith is seen in the good works it produces. Faith produces these good works. So again, it's not enough to hear the words of Jesus. We must do what he has commanded us as well. That is the evidence. Now, disciples who, regardless of any shifting cultural or religious fashions, disciples who build their lives on the bedrock of Jesus and his message of the kingdom of heaven are truly wise. Now James, or Jesus continues in verse 25, saying, And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been found on the rock. What is the rain or the floods or the winds in your life? Is it some trial you're going through? Is it, is it tribulation? Is it persecution for the faith you have? Is it corruption? Is it bad doctrine or unsound theology? See, Jesus doesn't say that, that the winds, that the rain, that the floods aren't going to come. Right? He doesn't say they're not going to come. He says, I'm the rock. He says, I will not fade away. I will not break apart. Upon the rock, nothing can be brought down. Have you ever uh, been out to like a beach or, or some sandy dirt area and the, the sun's kind of baked on it for a while and so it's, it's hardened up and you almost just like kick at it and you're like, oh yeah, it's solid ground. If someone that was unwise might come to that ground and say, yeah, this is hard, solid ground that I can build upon. And someone who's wise, a wise builder would see that and know that they need to dig several feet below to the surface or below the surface to the bedrock in order to establish a foundation to build on. Now, our foundation with Jesus, it can't just be some surface level commitment where we do some outward things in an attempt to have a good appearance. It has to be a deep rooted commitment to Jesus. And Jesus is what we need to establish the rest of our lives on. Continuing in verse 26, Jesus says, and everyone who hears these words of mine And does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. See, when when Jesus was delivering this message, when he was giving this this sermon on the mount, there's a good chance he was calling out the religious establishment with these words. The religious establishment of this time, um, they had kind of made a habit of embracing mere surface righteousness, you know, trying to do the right things in order to appear better. And they, standed, they were standing on the unstable foundation of their own self-proclaimed righteousness. Now, I don't think, I could be wrong, but I don't think I would be too far off to say that many people who are Christians today would, would still do this. People who would look at their lives and, and feel good, feel like they're a good person and that they've done good enough. 
And I'd hate to admit that I've been there myself, that I've seen things, I've seen other sin, and I've said, you know what, at least, at least I'm not doing that. At least that's not the struggle I have. At least those aren't the sins I've fallen into. I've, I've lived a pretty good life. I'd hate to admit that I've been there as well. Rather than seeing truly how broken, how needy, and just how lost I am and how unworthy I am, I, I tried to feel better about myself because I haven't, I haven't done those things. I've clung to my own standard of righteousness rather than seeing the grace that I've truly needed in my life. Have you ever looked at your life and found yourself content with where you were in relation to God? Like, like you had done enough to earn his favor. You had been good enough. If so, you, you may have been building on the sand without even realizing it. Now, I believe there are many things that we can build our house on, right? Like, it doesn't just have to be um, our, our goodness, our self-proclaimed righteousness. I believe there are many things we can build our house on. Uh, many of these things can be good things. They're, they're great things to have in our life. They're good things to put our attention toward. But they cannot replace the solid rock of Christ because they will ultimately fade away. Now, I want to talk about some of these foundations not for the purpose of, of throwing shade any particular direction or calling out any particular person or thing. I want to say these things so that we can un- uncover this sand-like foundation and we may begin to repent and turn away from whatever it is we're building on when we should be building on the solid rock. So the first thing I want to look at is our jobs. You know, our jobs, great thing. They provide a lot of things. They help us to uh, provide for our family, and they help us have nice things. They help us um, give to those who need it. We can do a lot of great things with our job. But if your job is your main focus, if your job is what you base every decision on, if all you think about and all you spend any of your energy on is your job, you may be building your house on sand. Like I said, some of these are, are good things. Our jobs are good and help us provide for our family. And speaking of family, our families can be that sand-like foundation that we build our life on. Again, good thing, great thing. We should, we should all love our families and care for our families. Our families help us feel loved and it helps us feel supported. And our family is a ministry in which we can work and, and share the gospel through. But it cannot be the foundation we build on. The best way that you can serve your family is to build your life on the rock and then help them do the same same in their own lives. If you've ever traveled across the country or to another country, if you've been on a plane, you've probably sat through the flight attendants going through their safety instruction. You know, they do, like, they've got directions over here, exits this way, and then they get to the portion where they say, in the, in the event of an emergency, your overhead bin will drop down an oxygen mask. And if that happens, fix your own mask before you help those around you. They say, you're no good to your child who can't reach the mask, who can't address their own needs if you pass out before you can help them. So before you can help your family, before you can address the foundations in their lives, you need to address the foundation in your life in order to better serve and help them. We must take care of our own foundation, and then we will be best equipped to help those around us, including those in and out of our family. This next one's kind of a hot button issue. Um, the next one is political parties. Now, I'm not going to take a certain political stance. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for or, or what issue to go in and try to address the most. I'm just going to put it out there political parties. If we spend most of our time worrying about who is in what office or what law is being passed, what thing is, is going on, or what temporary freedoms we have, then we are probably focusing in the wrong place. See, we have a freedom in Christ that is everlasting, that can never be taken from us, and it cannot be touched by any government body. Hear this, being informed and making informed decisions, a good thing, a great thing, I would encourage you to do that. But political parties and governments and politicians and laws, those things are going to come, they're going to go, and they're going to fade away, and in the scope of eternity isn't going to matter. The next one is, is similar. The next one is social issues. This falls in the same line of thinking as political parties. We want to address social issues, and we want to give people hope, and we want to help them feel included like they're a part of something. We want to give them a, a sense of belonging. We already know the ultimate hope that anyone can ever have, and that's Jesus Christ himself. 
if we really want to address social issues, if we really want to give people hope, if we really want people to have a sense of belonging, we need to address matters of the heart first. We need to get down to the root, to the foundation, and help them build their life upon the rock. The last one that I want to talk about right now is the church. And I don't just mean like our church. I mean the church, period. The church is, is good and it's necessary. Being in community with other believers is so needed. It's such a vital part of being a follower of Christ. But the church is made up of broken people. Right? It's made up of broken people, broken people who have repented and turned away and hopefully are striving to live lives that bring honor and glory to the name of Christ, but broken people nonetheless. The church, it's going to mess up, right? Like it's going to drop the ball and you're going to be left saying, what in the world are they doing? Why would they ever make that decision? What is going on? If you build your house on the church, you're building on sand. My hope and my prayer is that our church is being built on the rock and not on sand. That the church is seeking Christ and seeking to make him known. My prayer is that our church sings Christ glorified beyond status or standing or attendance or anything that's going to fade away. My prayer is that the church would seek Christ glorified beyond all things. And my prayer is that as a staff member at our church... That my foundation would never be on my position. My foundation would never be on, I'm a youth pastor at Pecola campus. My foundation would be on Christ alone. Now, there are so many other things we could try to build our foundation on. If you recognize that your foundation isn't being built on the rock, pray about what that foundation is. Pray about what needs to be stripped away and replaced with the rock that can withstand anything. Turn away from that and begin building on the only solid rock that will stand. Now, maybe you've heard these things and you know someone who has built their house on sand. You, you've seen it in your mind, a, a name or a face came to you immediately. I'm sure we can all think of someone if we take long enough. We can think of someone that falls in one of those categories I mentioned or maybe even one that I didn't talk about. Here's the truth. They need the gospel. They need the only rock that will never break, give away, or fade they need to know that there is no one righteous, not even one. They need to know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They need to know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. They need to know that God demonstrated his own love for us and that while we were still sinners broken apart from him, Christ died for us. They need to know that if they declare with their mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead, then they will be saved. For it is written with their heart, or for it is with, with their heart that they believe and are justified, and it is with their mouth that they profess their faith and are saved. They need to know that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. They need to know that since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And they need to know that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 10, 14 through 15, it says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. On Wednesday, August 12th, Officer Erica Urea with the Lodi Police Department, she had gone out and she, she went and was working her day like any other day, was making her rounds, patrolling her area, being diligent, looking for things that seemed off, looking for things to kind of shoot off that alarm that said, hey, I need to look into this. It was around... 8.45 in the morning when she could hear a train in the distance. She, she heard the train coming and she began to scan the area and that's when she saw it. A 66-year-old man trapped on the train tracks in his wheelchair unable to move. The body cam footage captures what happens in the next 45 seconds. Officer Urea exits her patrol vehicle, runs to this man's side and said, can you get up, can you move? 
And it's, it's obvious he can't. His wheelchair is broken down. There's an issue. He can't get up. So she begins to just pull and yank on him with all her might. And at the very last second, she falls backwards with him. They get off the, the track, and immediately the train zooms by. The two are on the ground, the train barely missing them. The man, unfortunately, he was injured in the accident. They didn't go into details, but I, I'm, I imagine that an injury from a train is not anything light. But he survived. Because of the actions of Officer Urea, he survived. There are people in your life right now in this very moment who are stuck in the tracks. There are people right now who have a train coming their way. It's headed their direction. And unless you intervene or someone intervenes, they're in store for tragedy. See, the man Officer Urea saved was injured. But he is alive. He survived. He lived another day. It may hurt someone for you to talk to them about the sin in their life. It may hurt someone for you to tell them, hey, I think you're building on the wrong foundation. They may be angry at you. They may not want to hear it. They may want nothing to do with it. But at least they might live. At least they might survive. They might make it out with their lives intact. Mark 8, 36 says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? They need the gospel. We as a church, we can't stand idly by as people continue to stand in the tracks. We can't stand idly by and watch people continue to build their houses on sand. We need to share with them the truth of the gospel, and we need to help them build their house on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. Maybe you've, you've seen this in your own life. You recognize that you're building on sand that's going to shift away, and you've, you've seen this in your life. You know that you've placed your life on things that will fade away. This morning, this moment, this is your invitation to begin building on the solid rock. Begin building your life on Jesus Christ, the firm foundation that will never break, never fade, and never go away. I'm going to pray this morning. I'm going to ask the band to come back up. We're going to have a time of invitation, a time of response. If you or someone you know needs to hear this gospel message, needs to address the foundation in your life, please don't hesitate. Pray with me. Father, we, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for all that you've done. You sent a precious sacrifice for us. You, you, you sent Jesus in perfect form who lived a perfect life and gave up an agonizing death for us. God, we don't address that enough. We're, let's just be honest. We don't address that enough. We don't thank you enough. We don't share that good news enough. Jesus, there at times there's, we all build on the wrong foundation. God, I, I pray that we would focus on you. We would focus on the solid rock. We would focus on pointing people towards the solid rock. And God, that we would chase after you above all things. That would seek after you beyond anything else in this world that will fade away, that will tear apart. God, help us, help us to know you. Help us to seek you. Help us to make you known. Help us to care about those around us enough to tell them who you are, to tell them the sacrifice that was made for them. Help us to love people. Father, we're broken, and we're in need of a Savior, and we just thank you for providing that. God, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.